welcome to Sassy Mama's second virtual webinar. I'm Kristen, the marketing manager at Sassy Mama. And today I'm here with Canadian International School counseling experts, Dr. Ron Drissner and Christy Finlay. Today we are so excited to discuss grit and resilience in children, which is so topical today. Children and adolescents are facing an increasing amount of everyday stress. And there are a lot of things that we as parents can do to help them cope with the challenges and grow. Before I turn it over to Ron and Christy, I would like to take a moment to remind everyone to keep yourself on mute so we can clearly hear Ron and Christy. Feel free to keep your cameras on. We love to see your faces. After the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for questions. If you have any, please put them in the Zoom chat function throughout the presentation, and I will read them out loud at the end of the presentation for Ron and Christy to answer. Thanks so much. Ron and Christy, over to you to introduce yourself and kick us off. Thanks very much, Kristen. We're super excited to be here with you all today. Thank you for taking the time. So I'm Christy Finley. This is my fifth year at CIS. And prior to coming to Singapore, I was a school counselor in two other countries, in South Korea and then also in Qatar. I am the mother of two lovely daughters. I'm one of them on the cusp of adulthood, although um, that depends on the day. And uh, the other one on the cusp of becoming a teenager. So the fun is just about to begin again. And good morning. Uh, glad everyone is joining us and uh, we're excited for this morning. And my name is Ron Drisner. I have been a counselor for the last 25 years. I worked 10 years in Canada and the Canadian mental health system as well as uh, the school system. And then has, I've been a school counselor for the last 15 years uh, overseas in 12 years in China. And this is my um, fourth year at CIS. So it's been fantastic. I've got three children of my own, um, along with my lovely wife, who is actually the uh, principal at the uh, in the elementary or the primary at CIS. I've got my the old our oldest son is just finishing up university at Simon Fraser in Vancouver, and our uh, second daughter is finishing up uh, her last years at uh, University of British Columbia, and then we have a grade ten daughter at CIS. So. Uh, exciting times. And as we often say in our presentations, uh, Christy and I, that we often do together, although we're presenting, we are learners too, and we are parents as well. And so we uh, have our good days and our challenging days, and we're with you. The As we often say, the struggle can be real at times. So, so just wanted to let you know that although we're presenting, we are also uh, learning as well in this process. And as we move along through the presentation, we want to hear from you. So please feel free to add questions and comments during the presentation. As uh, Kristen mentioned, um, just add those to the chat. And then at the end, she'll be moderating uh, the chat and we'll be answering those questions. So make sure you're, you're, if you do have comments or things that you're not sure of, add those while we present. So just to kick us off, um, you know, we would invite you to just think to yourself before we begin to present about, you know, what comes to your mind when you think about resilience in your children or for yourself. Um, and then again, um, you know, maybe some questions or something that, that uh, you would like to have some advice with um, at the end of the presentation. So first of all, um, the, the first part of our presentation, we're gonna define what are we talking about when we're speaking about resilience and what is grit? Um, they're two very linked concepts, and yet they're not, they're not entirely interchangeable. So that's the first thing. Next, we're going to talk about stress as a part of our everyday lives and the idea that um, it's how we perceive of stress that makes a difference for our children and that helps them to become more resilient ultimately. And then the last part, we're going to share some practical strategies for parents in terms of how to promote both resilience and grit in your kids. So when we're talking about resilience, essentially what it is is our human capacity to bounce back and to rebound after we've had a perceived failure in our life. Um, and again, resilience is key to our hopefulness. It's key to the idea that 
you know, it, it's inevitable that things are going to be challenging at times in our lives, but how do we rebound from that? How do we make sense of those opportunities, grow from them, and then move on? And that is resilience. The good news about this is that like hopefulness or gratitude or other concepts, resilience isn't something that we either have or we don't have. It's very much a way of being and a way of, of looking at the world that can be grown and learned. So that's the, the hopeful news. So stress um, gets a bad rap. We, we hear about stress and we talk about it and we think about it all the time and complain about it all the time, right? But I, I think it's important for us to also recognize that stress is not entirely a negative thing. I mean, if we didn't feel some degree of stress, it, you know, it would be very difficult to get up in the morning. Stress can be a motivator too. And so there are lots of positive events in our lives that cause a type of stress that's called eustress, um, where it tips the balance and starts to impact you know, our health and our well-being. then we've, we move into distress, which obviously we want to avoid. But when we think about our children in terms of eustress, I mean, starting school, um, meeting our new teacher, making a team, uh, being elected to student council, those are all positive events um, that also cause stress. So the idea similar to resilience is that we all experience stress in, in life and we're not trying to, um, to avoid those experiences. It's more that we're trying to learn how to manage it in a, in a healthy way so that it just becomes a part of everyday life and we're not moving from one crisis to another. Um, an American psychologist coined the term grit um, way back in 2013 in a in a six minute TED talk that hopefully um, you'll be able to, to have a look at later. I really encourage you to, to listen. It's very interesting and it's super inspirational. The TED talk, uh, which then later became a, a best-selling book from Angela Duckworth, talked about the idea that what well, was based on her research and what she found in, in interviewing um, children and adults, um, students, participants at the National Spelling Bee. She, um, she interviewed Marines and doctors and CEOs and people from all different walks of life with the question, what is it that makes, makes people successful? And so what came out of her research was the idea that sure, being talented, being intelligent, you know, those are things that, that, that some people are fortunate enough to be born with. But in terms of success in life, what mattered twice as much as, as intelligence or, um, or talent was effort. And so again, this idea that, um, you know, even in areas where we're not naturally good, as long as we are committed to getting better, we can. And so that's a super empowering idea for, for children and for all of us alike. So Duckworth, in her research, again, she came up with what essentially was a recipe for grit. And what she said is that in order to be successful, truly successful, whatever that means, because of course we all define that differently, people need to have passion and they need perseverance over the long haul. We need to feel that what we're doing is important and that we're willing to come at this every single day knowing that what we're doing is going to benefit us or our community or someone in some way. So that is what grit is about. Um, she said it perfectly when she described grit as living life as though it's a marathon rather than a sprint. Uh, a couple of years ago at UWC, Ron and I and a few others were really um, fortunate to be able to be part of a wonderful presentation that was given by Dr. Michael Carr Gregg, an Australian psychologist, and our very own um, local psychologist, Dr. Natalie Games. And so it was all about how to support um, children and youth and how to build resilience. And so one thing that, that Dr. Carr Gregg spoke of was the idea that there are these six different things that we want to encourage in our children. Um, number one, they need charismatic adults in their lives. Of course, we are important to our children, but they need other adults because as we all know, if you've got a teenager, it doesn't matter how brilliant your advice to them is, 
if you're a mom or your dad, they don't really want to hear about it. So having other people in their lives is, is really important. Um, they need controlled risk taking. Now, when we're talking about risk taking, it's more, um, you know, healthy risks. Obviously, we're not talking about dangerous things in any way. We're talking about encouraging our kids to try a bunch of different things. It doesn't matter whether you're, you know, the, the fastest one on the swim team or the best singer in the choir. Follow the things that you're interested in and give them a whirl. Um, the next one, positive thinking, we're going to touch on that in, in some detail later on in the presentation, so I won't go too much into that right now. It, finding meaning um, it is really important, and this relates back to what I was just talking about in terms of Angela Duckworth's notion of grit. In order to persevere towards a long-term goal, we need to be able to get up every morning in spite of the challenges and believe that what we're doing is important. So therefore finding meaning in something for kids is, is really vital. Islands of competency, um, this is associated with the controlled risk-taking. When kids are able to try different things and see how they like different things, they're going to realize that you know they may really develop passions for things and they might see themselves grow in certain skills or in certain interests and so with those increasing islands of competency kids develop a greater sense of who they are um, and then the final one is social emotional competency and of course as children grow older and move towards adolescence um, their peer groups become very, very important to them, um, more so even, we feel at times, than their family relationships. And so therefore, it's super important for them to know how to develop and how to foster healthy relationships, because we all need to feel a sense of belonging. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Christy. And, and uh, tag team over to me. And... Uh, I think we can all agree um, that resilience and grit are characteristics that all of us want to see in our own children. And, but what, we, what, what can we do as parents practically day to day to promote resilience? Let's look at uh, right now at some practical strategies that you can start using today to start developing resiliency that are really practical and user-friendly that can take some things to develop that resilience. The first one is uh, relational resilience. Um, kids who are resilient know how to have positive relationships. Now, it might seem obvious spending quality time with our children is a good thing. But in our busy world, this can be a challenge and not as easy at times as I'm sure a lot of us can agree as we would like it to be. And that it's something that could be taken for granted. And also, one of the key words here is quality, and in particular with electronics, we can um, be together, but the quality of the time that we're actually spending together uh, can be questionable. It's so easy to be on the computers, be on devices, and, and be together, but actually really not interacting the way we should be or could be. So what I mean by quality is doing things together that both people enjoy and involves interaction and communication. A part of this is active lift listening, which we'll cover more about in a minute. The next thing in developing, uh, to develop uh, resiliency in our children is emotional re resiliency. Um, Kids who are resilient know how to express their emotions in a healthy and an appropriate way. Um, and this is something that we as parents can promote and help our children develop. Kids who feel heard will share their stories and emotions will, willingly. Active listening is showing your child uh, that you're actually listening. And by doing this is by doing eye contact, um, body language and responding appropriately to make them really feel that they're being heard. Um, and it's one of the challenges as parents, and I know I've felt this, is resist giving answers. Uh, really, what we're trying to do is make them feel heard and invest in them by stopping what we're doing and really listening, especially trying to link behavior with emotions. So what I mean 
mean by that is trying to see whatever the behavior is, try and put a, a, an emotional name to it. So if you hear a door slam and maybe some yelling, then that might sound angry. So it's to say, to, to link a, a, an emotional word to what is their behavior. And this links to emotional uh, literacy. Teaching our kids to use feeling words by teaching, teaching them feeling the actual feeling words. And one way is to print on, if you go online, you can actually find um, feeling charts that have feelings with the faces on them and print that out and put it in a prominent place to really promote the ability of our kids to be able to, to link what they're, what's going on inside of them to an actual feeling word. And then the last thing in this area is using paraphrasing. And what that means is this is actually a, a counseling trick or, or tool. And what it is, is, is to use the phrase, it sounds like you're really, and then an emotional word. So for example, if you do hear the door slamming or you do hear yelling and you go up and the, one of your kids seems to be upset, it's to go, it seems like you're really angry right now. What's going on for you? And what that does is it opens up a discussion. It opens up now you could be wrong. And, and what happens is if they say, no, I'm not angry, I'm frustrated, then that's fine. You've got them starting to express their feelings. And that's what we're talking about, about emotional literacy. The next thing is cognitive resilience. And this is really um, challenging uh, negative thoughts and really trying to promote positive uh, thought processes. Uh, kids can be very negative about themselves, just as we as adults often can be. We can be our toughest critics. So challenging isn't to order them to stop thinking in a certain way. What it is is, per, per, is to per really persuade them um, to line up reality with what they're thinking. In psych psychology, this is called cognitive dissonance. It's where th maybe they, for example, my daughter, she, she's she's, it's easy for her to say, I'm not doing very well in school because she's comparing herself to other students. She's, she's saying, well, I'm not doing as well as they are. But in reality, her grades have really gone up. So by challenge that saying, you know what, your grades have actually really increased over the last year or two. You're actually doing way better now than you were two years ago. So that's a gentle way of challenging some of that self-criticism that can so easily happen, especially in adolescence. And this can happen, this, this can look like a, a cycle at times. And it's so easy to develop into this where um, on the left is the failure cycle where negative input, whether it's from uh, a well-meaning adult or whether it's from peers, where they can start feeling quite negative about themselves. In, and that can lead to thought processes that are negative, which can really lower self-esteem. And then that creates a feeling of being discouraged, which can lead to uh, negative behavior. So for example, if a student does, or a child does poorly on an exam, that's an event. And that can lead them to think, I'm no good at math. And that can lead them to feeling discouraged, which leads them to what's the point of studying? So, so then maybe they don't put the effort in and then the grades go down and they do poorly on their next exam. But the good news in this is that this can be turned around. On the right is a success cycle. And so we can interrupt that negative failure cycle anywhere along the way by being positive influences and, and encouragers for our children. And so we can turn that negative, that failure cycle into a success cycle by really promoting some of the things that Christy said, by bringing in those uh, those things that develop resilience, such as charismatic adult, giving them opportunities to feel success, um, doing all those things that can create that resilience that creates a success cycle. Thank you, Ron. So these next three slides um, speak to, you know, if we're noticing that our child does seem to be, um, you know, really harboring negative thoughts which then are developing into negative feelings and resulting in a lack of confidence you know how do we work against that how do we push against that um the next three slides are from a wonderful source uh, for parents called reachout.com 
lots of great advice in terms of how to encourage your kids about mental health. That's definitely worth checking out. So the first thing um, we want to do with our children is, is to teach them to be really aware of that little voice in their head, you know? Is, is that a positive message that I'm telling myself or do they tend to be quite negative things that I'm saying to myself? So, so, of course, when we're wanting to change anything, the very first thing we need is awareness of that. So that's step number one. So if I were to give an example, um, Ron gave an example uh, in the success failure cycle of math, of his, his daughter with math and her grades and things like that. If I were to give a more social emotional example, say if a, a young child sees that there's a new student in their class, and so they think, oh, you know, I'm going to reach out and go and try to make friends with that person. And then they try and maybe they don't get a very favorable or a very warm response back. Um, that could result in the child thinking, oh, geez, I guess I'm not very likable. This person doesn't want to be my friend. Um, so first of all, in that example, we would want them to notice that based on one interaction, that they're telling themselves these quite negative messages about not being likable. Um, next slide, please, Kristen. So the second step is to challenge those thoughts by asking ourselves or by teaching our child to ask themselves, is there evidence? So in this way, they're becoming almost like a scientist trying to remove you know the feelings about the event and just be really logical about it you know when I think about um given my previous example what I said to the new child did I say anything that was rude or offensive no what I said was fine okay um if my best friend had a similar experience and they were feeling so terribly about themselves and that they weren't likable how would I respond to that because as Ron said earlier, we're often our harshest critics. So reminding kids that you want to talk to yourself in the same way that you would talk to and support your friend. That's a very powerful tool. Um, and then the last one is, the, is to challenge that self-talk. Oh, sorry, change our self-talk. This is number three. So once we're aware, we've challenged it, now we wanna actively change that so that our behavior doesn't change. Um, and so instead of saying, you know, it's true that new kid doesn't like me and therefore, you know, I, I'm not gonna approach other new kids, we realize, no, there's no evidence for that. Um, remember last summer when I went to camp and I met my very best friend, you know, you, when you elicit examples from kids, they're going to be able to, to provide lots of evidence where the negative thought isn't the truth. And therefore, um, they start to think, well, you know what, maybe that new kid is just really shy. I mean, maybe it's possible that they don't speak very much English. And so therefore, in the next situation, they're, they're, not, they're not going to shy away from approaching another new student, believing that you know, it, it's something negative about themselves. They're gonna go ahead and they're gonna do it again. So those are some uh, tips. And, and for your interest, what we basically talked about, this is the essence of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is uh, a really, um, a very prominent type of therapy in the world of psychology right now. Thanks, Christy. And, and also just to build on, on what Christy just covered is um, one of the areas that we as parents can really help also develop that positive self-talk in our children is in the area of, uh, of encouragement. And again, that's something I think we all do. And, and I, I know as a parent, always try and do but it's to also be very purposeful in it and and to really be um precise in how we encourage to make sure that it's it's really effective and and really developing the skills and 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 strengths of our children so one of the things is giving positive feedback there's really three steps in, in providing that kind of feedback. And there's three things that you can do. Just number one, be sincere. Now, of course, we're always sincere. You know, we want to be sincere, but it's, it's easy to say, you know, you get a drawing from your child and, and say, this is amazing, you know, or you see their schoolwork and, oh, this is to say, this is fantastic. Well, it, if, it, if you really feel it isn't 
their best work. It's not to be discouraging, but it's to be honest and go, have you really put the best effort into this? Have you really, um, is there areas you could improve on this? And so to be honest on, on where you actually be, because if you start saying it's always good, but you really feel it isn't, or vice versa, you say it's not good, but really it's actually, it's an improvement. It's to really be honest about that and be sincere. The second is praise specifics. It's so easy to say, oh, great job, or that was really good. And, and that's, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think what we're talking about is, again, being more precise on that. And so in praising specifics, it's saying what you actually like about what they've done. And so if it's a piece of artwork that they've drawn, is to sh and say they were coloring, and they've really improved at coloring within the circles, is to say that. And, and to really think what you like about it and say, you've really improved at color. Or if it's sports, it's, it's to say what they've really improved at or what they've done really well, rather than just, oh, you played really well today. Be specific about what they actually did in the sporting event or in whatever it is that you really thought had they've done well at. And then the last thing is affirm not just results, but their effort. And again, this is, it's easy to focus on the tangible, right? It's easy to focus on what you can see. So if you see them score a goal or you see them um, perform really well in a recital, of course, you want to encourage that and say they did a great job. But also, how about if they don't do well? How about if they, they didn't do as well as you thought they could have, but they really put the effort in and they really... Uh, really put the, the time in preparing, it's to encourage them in that because sometimes there are steps in improvement. And as Christy said earlier, it's the effort that really makes the change in resilience. And we wanna be really encouraging of our kids that if they're putting that effort in to really spur them on and let them know that it is going to make a difference, keep going, keep doing it. And it's so important to hear that from their parents. And so that's such a vital part in developing resilience in our kids. And back to you, Christy. Thank you. So this is our final slide before we get to um, some questions, hopefully, and hearing um, your responses to all of this. Um, this was from, uh, this is actually a fridge magnet that uh, a student gave to me several years ago, and I keep it in my office and I often point it out to kids. Falling down is part of life, getting back up is living. And this really um, sums up resilience, you know. As parents, it's so painful to see our kids experience heartbreak or challenge or even failure at times. But at the end of the day, um, this is part of living. And so what we need to teach them is, is how to get back up those skills so that they're not devastated by everything that happens because these are life skills. As much as we wanna keep them in a bubble, that's really not doing them any favors for the future. So we want to just be there and teach them how to get back up and how to move on. You know, these experiences make us stronger and, and more competent people. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ron and Christy, for those great thoughts on grit and resilience and the distinction between the two. It was so helpful to learn about the types of resilience, relational, emotional, and cognitive, and what we as parents can do to help encourage it in our children. I relate to so much of what you have said, being a third culture kid myself and coping with new schools and friends. I struggled with math and always had this internal monologue of not being good at it that has stuck with me and persists till this day. And now as a new mom, I'm starting to think about some of these things already with my eight month old. So really great to hear all these thoughts. Um, we've had some questions come in already. But as a reminder, if you have something you'd like to ask, please put it in the Zoom chat function and we will do our best to get to all those questions. Uh, the first question we have is, is really interesting. Uh, I think uh, a relevant and topical question for Singapore can be how to foster grit in children when so many kids are growing up in Singapore are coddled and pampered uh, by helpers um, coming from a piece of love and nurture. Uh, so how would you guys uh, kind of respond to that uh, in life in Singapore? 
specifically. Well, I, I think uh, Christy can add her thoughts too, but I think, you know, resilience comes in different different ways, right? And, and I think the challenges uh, kids face, whether it's in Europe, North America, or here in Singapore, can, can look differently. And I think a lot of the challenges they face, um, you know, in raising my own kids overseas, yeah, they face different challenges. I'm, I'm from Canada originally. Different challenges than they faced in Canada, but they still faced significant challenges. Um, in terms of culture, uh, you know, as you said, Kristen, you know, growing up overseas as a third culture kid, th those are significant challenges. Our kids, they, they show amazing resilience in learning languages and, and having to, to deal with multiple cultures in their day every day. And that takes resilience. And I think in terms of um, dealing with helpers, I think that's a really good point because that is an issue uh, growing up overseas. And I think it's working with your helper to really create boundaries that making sure that they aren't being quote unquote coddled to make sure that the, the helper is aware of what you as parents have expectations on. I think that could almost be a whole other presentation, but, but it's really communicating with your helper to, to bring them on the team and help them understand also how to develop resilience in your child. Yeah, I might just add, you know, one other thing is that I think it's easy for us to look at the experiences of our kids here in Singapore and, and really see that side of, of them being pampered and coddled and, and like that. But the other side of it, too, though, is that, you know, while our kids may have certain advantages and they've traveled all over the world and all these amazing things, they also, there's the downside too, you know, they've already in their young lives said so many um, painful goodbyes, you know, with teachers, with best friends, um, who people who come and go. And so there's a lot of, of complex unresolved grief sometimes too. And, and that's not easy either, you know, so there's while they may not be making their beds every day, although they should be, um, you know, being able to manage those complicated feelings of grief and loss, that is, is resilience too. Great, lots of that. I think that answers the question perfectly. Life in Singapore is easy, but there are still a lot of challenges that kids do face here. Very true. Um, we had a question come in from the chat, and I think this is an interesting one. When fear and failure prevents the child from trying new things, how do the parents motivate them? What words to say if the child doesn't win at a game, how do you mo motivate them to try again um, and again? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, as with so many things that our children learn, um, the way that we model how we deal with those experiences is probably key. We want our kids to grow up and not be fearful of failure. And so, um, you know, we, we don't want to make a big deal about failure. You know, it, it, they need to learn at, that we're not always going to be the best at everything. In fact, we may rarely be the best at anything, you know, but, but there are other values that are, that are as important as winning. You know, and so we, we want to just keep encouraging that growth mindset, that idea that, well, I, I love to play soccer. I'm not the best on the team, but if I am committed to this and I practice and I'm willing to work hard, I can get better. You know, at the, again, coming back to the idea that the effort is so much more important than talent. So I think as parents, just again, reframing for our kids, it's not a big deal to fail. Everybody fails. Share your own failures and challenges. Absolutely, and, and I, I would add that I think it's really uh, letting uh, our kids know that learning is, is such a process. I remember my oldest son, he would go in to learn something new and he would expect to know it right away. He would start, I remember he had basketball practice and he, he couldn't shoot baskets his first time he ever played basketball and he, he was ready to give up. And it was just to say, you know what, like, you're just starting, give it time. Uh, learning takes time, be patient, and you will get it. And, and he did. And so I think it's uh, another tip along with what Christy was mentioning around the effort is also just breaking it down into pieces and say, you're just doing step by step, you know, kids want to go right to the end and, and have it all figured out and just go, you know what, you're just figuring this piece out. 
do this piece and then you'll figure out the next piece and eventually they'll come together and you'll know the whole thing, <laughs> but it takes time, so. Thanks for that, it makes a lot of sense. And I think this next question, I think Ron, you kind of touched on it, but maybe we could get a little bit more clarity behind is what if there is evidence that the self negative talk is actually true? So the child is really slow at finishing work and that's just the state of things. How do we help shift that mindset and get them back into kind of a positive um, cycle? Yeah, I, I think, you know, and we didn't touch on this part of it, but, but so much of this, the, the foundation of this, and, and a lot of you as parents are already doing this, but it's, it's about being relational and it's that quality time and really having that, that ability to sit down and talk and listen to our kids and, and having that relationship where you have the um the capacity and the the trust that you can talk about things and i think it is it's having those honest conversations where you're challenging things but not in a negative way you're just presenting that this is you're, you're observing that there there is a concern and that they're not putting in the effort maybe that they should be and i think a lot of times it's, it's using questions rather than saying you're not putting the effort in is to say, do you think you're putting the effort in in your math that you should be, you know, do you, because your results, you know, aren't, get, you're not getting what you used to or whatever. And, and ask it as a, as a discussion rather than coming in telling them what to do. It's to have a conversation about it and really, li again, listening to what their challenges are, because on the surface, it might seem obvious that this is what the, the issue is that's causing them whatever the discouragement or the lack of effort. But it might turn out, you might be surprised that there may be something else going on for them that is actually the source of that. And so I'm always surprised what is actually the, the source of what is creating that discouragement or that lack of effort. And it may not be what we always think it is. Yeah. Again, I would come back to the idea that, you know, teaching kids to be gritty and to be resilient. Um, you know, that that's so essential. And it comes back to the idea of growth mindset and the idea of neuroplasticity. I mean, this is just incredible. The idea that we now know that we can grow and change different parts of our brain through through practice. So I think when you frame it like that for kids, what a huge empowering game changer that is, because then it's no longer, oh, I just simply can't do this it becomes, well, this is really challenging for me right now, but I know because there's scientific evidence that if I continue to work at it, I am going to see um, improvements, you know, slow and steady wins the race. Yeah, that is very true. Slow and steady definitely wins the race. Uh, we've had a lot of questions come in from the chat group now. Um, so here's another one. Um, my son is seven. He loves to win. If he thinks he won't win, he doesn't even want to try because he doesn't want second place. Uh, how can we help get him to try again? Um, help this mama out. Yeah, I think, you know, that's, that's a pretty common thing, especially with the, the younger grades, um, especially when they're starting out and especially in sports, they do want to win or they do want to have success. I remember with my kids, many times we'd come home from a sporting event when they were young and they'd be in tears uh, because, and they want to stop, right? And I think part of it, there's, there's a couple things in that. I think one thing that, that I suggest to parents is when, when children start out with, whether it's music lessons or sporting event, uh, playing sports, or whatever activity they're starting is to really talk about um, expectations and around w the commitment level that you're looking for long term, and to say, you know what, like if you're if we're going to start you in soccer or we're going to get piano lessons or whatever it may be, is that our expectation is that you follow through for the for the whole season or you take a variety of lessons and and that we agree at the outset, this is what we're going to do. So I think that's the first thing. So with, you know, two games in, they're like, I don't want to play anymore. It's like, no, we've, we've agreed, we've committed that you're going to keep going. So you, you need to keep going on that. The other thing is too, is I think it's just developing your, that sense of, of 
belief and that sense of um, it's it's that whole positive uh, failure cycle and that positive cycle is to really encourage them and saying, yeah, today was hard and and acknowledging that and listening to their feelings and 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 validate their feelings, not just kind of go, it'll be okay, don't worry about it, but to really hear the frustration and the sadness that they're experiencing and do that active listening, but also to encourage them and say like, it, it's, it'll be better next time. Like, don't give up, keep going. And, and you really use some of those skills that we were talking about and making it real and supporting them. Because when they're, when they're sad for that seven-year-old, that's, they're really sad. That's a real thing, you know? And, and so it's really spending the time and allowing them to feel heard and allowing that to be expressed. Yeah. And again, just to, as a parent, to emphasize with them that sure everybody loves to win winning is fun you know if we had a choice we would always win but the truth is that that's not always the case and there are lots of other reasons that we we play sports and that we do things too you know it's wonderful for our bodies to get out and move and get exercise and we get to see our friends and and it's fun and we laugh and so we want to emphasize not just the end result, but the other things that, that come out of being part of a team or being involved in something. Sometimes kids also like to hear about, you know, their famous, um, their sporting heroes, because of course, if you, if you, you know, look into the history of Michael Jordan or who, I mean, whoever it is that they look up to, inevitably those people have had, you know, because they've got grit and they've been doing this forever. They've had tons of experiences of challenge and of failure and, and, and they've moved beyond it because they're so committed and they've got passion and perseverance. Sounds, sounds good. And that, yes, that encouraging language is so important in kind of helping them get past this. We definitely agree. Here's another one that also seems to kind of deal with the kind of younger children. Um, how do you help a four-year-old handle perceived re rejection? Uh, my four-year-old sees this classmate at drop-off sometimes in the morning. She always says hi, and he ignores her every single time. According to the teacher, they don't really get along in class. Do I tell her that he's going, to, going through something or and didn't want to say hi? He keeps ignoring her. At what point, as a parent, do you just you know say you're not going to get along with everyone and to ignore another child? <laughs> Or should the kid just keep persisting on trying to be nice? It's, it's a tough one. That, that is a tough one. And, and as a parent, that's a really hard one too. I think all of these, anytime we see our, our children facing challenges, those are so heartbreaking and so hard uh, to watch happen. And it's, it's, it is difficult to know what to do, it's, especially when it's peer relationships and social situations. Uh, I think in that, in that one, you know, and, and the, the, what jumps out at me right away, and Christy, you can add your piece, what you think is the developmental piece. Um, when you get into four-year-olds, things change from one month to the next, and you can have such variance developmentally in terms of verbal ability, cognitive ability. Um, they're all over the map. So of course you don't explain all that to your child, but, but it's being aware of that, that, that there's such a difference that some kids are, are moving along verbally at such a high level and others aren't. And then there's, if, if this is in, I'm assuming this is in Singapore, you have cultural ling linguistic differences where different uh, students are, are, are more confident with their English, others aren't. So I think that's the background I would, I would kind of go to first as a parent, that it, it may not be necessarily a personal thing. It, it's just kind of, it could be a developmental part. I think in terms of the relational part is, is to develop, it, it's again, to go back to our, our presentation around that resiliency where, where they have the confidence, they have the ability and that sense of self in themselves and that's they're four years old so that that's a bit of a different thing but you can still start where where they have a sense of of this is who i am and if that person doesn't say hi to me that's okay um i'm going to still be friendly and i think what what they said in the question is a start to the solution is still be friendly still be and and kind of move on to the next person and and those friendships change and, and adjust um, but i think again it's to encourage them and, and develop that sense of of self that their sense of identity isn't dependent on whether that person says hi or not. Um, Christy, you can add your piece. No, that that's that was exactly um, what I was thinking. That was brilliant. 
<laughs> wow, that's a first. Someone record this. <laughs> we are recording. Well, we are <laughs> recording it. Um, perfect. So developing that sense of self is very important and great to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, we have another question that has come in on uh, for a younger child as well. So my daughter is five years old. Recently, she's been telling me that there's another child in school that's always bragging to her and boasting about the things she has. She told me this is affecting her, even though she tries not to think about it. How do I advise her to kind of move past this and kind of not let this get her down? Yeah, again, I, that, that's tricky because as a parent, you know, you want to encourage your child, but then of course you don't want to say anything, you know, negative about another child. Um, but I, I think that probably just to emphasize that, you know, how does that make you feel when, when, when that girl it, it brags or when she boasts? And to, so to use that to build your daughter's emotional literacy so that then she recognizes that, oh, you know what? That doesn't feel so good for me when this other person does that. So then they tuck that away in their mind as, you know, that's something that I'm gonna remember not to do, you know, because it, it doesn't always make other people feel good. Um, and then I guess maybe just to explain that, you know, people, sometimes people get confidence in themselves through many different ways. And, you know, you get confidence through being a really good girl and, and being friendly and being a kind friend and by doing your best. And maybe for other people, they get confidence, you know, more from, from having nice things or stuff like that. So that you're, you're explaining in a way that everybody's different in terms of their values and you're not saying anything negative about that, but just reinforcing for your daughter that her values are about being a wonderful friend and a good human being and a sensitive person and, you know, like that. Yeah, I, and I, those are great thoughts. And, and I think too, having a conversation, whether it's they're five years old or, or 16 years old, having the ongoing conversation, again, it's about relationship and conversations, right? And, and I think having the conversation about what, what our children want in their friendships, what kind of friends do they want? What are the characteristics that they value? What do they bring to a friendship? What are the strengths that they feel they bring, but also what are they looking for? And I think help, helping them process, because it's easy just to go with the most popular kid or the kid that you I think has the nice toys or whatever it is, but it's to really think about what are the characteristics. And, and I think friendships is such a vital part in developing resiliency for, for children, choosing the right people that are encouragers, people that are supportive of, of our kids and, and helping them make the choice of having the, being surrounded by the right, uh, by the right people. And that they make those, because that's such a, a critical piece, not only when they're five, but also when they are 16. Yeah, that's some great advice. Okay, so we're running out of time. And so we'll start to wrap this up. But there's just one I want to share with you. Uh, another parent from CIS really seems to enjoy this talk and was wondering if more of these could be organized um, at CIS. So I'll leave that with you guys uh, to figure out. Um, but nice to, nice to hear that they found this helpful. Um, so thank you so much, Ron, Christy, and the Canadian International School. Um, and to all of you for joining us on our Sassy Mama Expert Chat. If we didn't get to your questions, we will send out the answers to them and the follow-up email along with recordings. So do look out for that. Um, in that email, you also have a link to provide feedback on today's event, plus an opportunity to tell us what topics you'd like to see next. Uh, we hope you have all learned some helpful tips on fostering grit and resilience in children and maybe even yourself today. Uh, stay tuned for our upcoming events. Our next expert chat will be in October. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your participation and thank you to Sassy Mama for your efforts in helping organize this. This has been a lot of fun and uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you everyone.